Um, oh, I do have a couple of thank yous. Uh, I do want to thank the Sheep and Goat Predator Management Board here in Texas for funding my position. Uh, Dr. Redden, our um, oh, center director here, and Robert Pritz and Jamie Sanford for helping us uh, get the Zoom up and going and, and also on Facebook Live. Uh, if you're looking for any type of GPS trackers, um, I'll go ahead and contact Lone Star Tracking. Uh, Thomas Ramard over there will, uh, will help you get uh, all set up with GPS trackers. And Lone Star Tracking is our uh, all webinar sponsor again today. So I, I want to thank them. Um, so with us today, um, we have Dr. Laura Stump. Um, oh, she earned her bachelor's in animal science and is a doctor of veterinary medicine at Louisiana State University. Uh, she joined Nestle Purina Pet Care in 2019 and enjoys sharing her passion for nutrition in her role supporting veterinary teaching hospitals, uh, Nestle Purina sales divisions, and veterinary practitioners in canine and feline nutrition education. Uh, Dr. Stump also provides support to Purina's sporting dog group and enjoys engaging with working dog enthusiasts across the country. In addition to practicing veterinary medicine and surgery, Dr. Stump has a strong interest in future of animal health and has worked in public policy in Washington, D.C. So again, thank you today um, all for coming out, Dr. Stump, and, and giving us a presentation on livestock guardian dog nutrition. So um, with that, ma'am, I will uh, turn it over to you. Absolutely. Thank you, Bill. I really appreciate that. Um, I spend most of my time in my role at Purina talking to veterinarians and, and vet students, and so it's a real treat to be here with y'all today. And I appreciate you giving me the time and, and coming out and showing up for my lecture. And hopefully um, you won't be too bored by the end of everything. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen and kind of jump into it. And as I, I told Bill, Bill, is everything okay? Oh, I just had one quick um, yeah. oh, housekeeping thing. Um, if everybody would just post their questions in the chat room and we'll get to y'all at the end of the presentation today. So thank, thank you. you. It is a real pleasure to be here. I told Bill I nabbed this uh, photo off of his Facebook page, so I hope he doesn't mind loaning it to me for the presentation. But I just kind of wanted to walk through a couple of different things with y'all today about pet food, um, going back to the basics of you know the nutrients that are within pet food, um, what certain things are useful for, how to read that pet food label, find the information that you're looking for, and always relating it back to your guardian dogs. Um, and so I wanted to kind of jump into a, a lot of different stuff here, but first a little bit about myself. I think Bill gave you a, a good background, but I'm a vet, uh, what we call a veterinary communications manager um, with Purina. I really enjoy my work with them. And to start us off, I just wanted to cover a little bit of our philosophy at Purina um, and give you a little taste of, of what that's like. Um, and that is um, a philosophy that was put forth by uh, Purina's founder, William H. Danforth, and he always started with the philosophy of never be satisfied that what has been achieved is sufficient. And so that drives a lot of our um, forward thinking and research that we do. Purina is a company that invests uh, actually a lot of um, profit and money back into researching um, and putting their kind of heads in that laboratory and figuring out where is the next space where we can go with nutrition um, to optimize that for um, not just pets, but for working dogs um, and uh, animals everywhere. So this is the always kind of the foundation of where we're coming from when we're talking about canine nutrition. So kind of first off, you know, why does nutrition matter? You know, you think about it, it fuels your day-to-day -day activities, right? And that dog's day-to-day -day activities. But when you start to break it down, nutrition and the nutrition that we provide to animals actually affects their health. Um, and very integral components of their health. So it plays an, a very big role in disease prevention from the outset, recovery time of an animal if it gets injured or it gets diseased, um, that animal's overall lifespan, its working life, um, and its resilience too. Um, you know, in a study that Purina has done actually on one of our therapeutic diets that's for, um, it's un available on, only under prescription from a veterinarian, it's for um, seizures, but also what we call canine cognitive dysfunction. Um, in that diet, it's a, it's a wonderful diet, but when we're doing these studies, what we actually do is we have to, um, before we test a, a diet on a subject, say these um, dogs with cognitive dysfunction syndrome, 
Um, you know, we know that it's safe to feed to them, but we have to kind of stabilize them. They'll all be on, you know, 5, 10, 15 different diets when they're coming into the study. And so we've got to stabilize them all on another diet before we introduce the 10th well, diet. Um, and what we okay. actually find is that, you know, when we're looking at the diet that they were transitioned onto, which was essentially purina dog chow at the time, um, they actually saw improvements in some of these dogs' uh, cognitive dysfunction syndrome kind of from the outset. Um, so really in their ability for their brains to work. And that is entirely related to the digestibility of the formula and the bioavailability of the nutrients in that diet, which we're going to get into a little bit. Um, so when they were going through that period, you know, we see that one of those number one factors in that dog, you know, actually being able to utilize what's going on in its brain for a good portion of its life um, is going to be related to nutrition as well. The goals of nutrition, of course, uh, we want to ensure proper growth of puppies and then maintenance um, of our adult dogs through a correct nutrient balance. We want to make sure that that is appropriate for the life stage of that pet, which we'll cover over. Adequate bioavailability and digestibility. So digestibility is essentially the ability for that food to be digested by that dog. Uh, is it appropriately cooked? Are those carbohydrate sources cooked to where the dog is actually going to be able to digest and absorb those nutrients? Um, that absorption piece is the bioavailability that we're talking about. So those two things, digestibility and bioavailability, are even more important than the actual nutrition value of what's in the diet. Because if the dog can't get it out of the diet when it eats it, then it doesn't matter. It's all going to come out the back end, essentially, at the end of the day. Um, the goal of nutrition, just on a very basic level, of course, is going to provide energy. Um, does that through providing calories. Um, and it's going to protect the body, so immune support. Um, a lot of the components within a pet food are actually going to go into building, you know, white blood cells, building antibodies, different proteins that circulate um, to viruses, to the bacteria, to offensive things in the environment, and be able to help that dog kind of bounce back from any insult there. So when we talk about, you know, is that diet complete and balanced? And I mentioned life stage. We're going to go into that a little bit deeper more. But basically, you know, how do you know if a pet food is complete and balanced? So you want to look for that AFCO statement of nutritional adequacy. And we'll talk about where you find that, what that means. Um, but nutritionally complete and balanced means that it provides all of the nutrients that that dog needs in correct proportions for the intended life stage. And all of that should be laid out pretty clear and should be, will be in that AFCO statement of nutritional adequacy. When we're looking at nutrients, um, the nutrient categories can be broken down basically into what we call your macronutrients. So we'll talk about that a little bit. Your essential nutrients are essentially your macronutrients and your micronutrients. Your macronutrients are kind of those big categories that we think of, right? So those are your fats, your carbohydrates, your proteins, water also. Uh, micronutrients are vitamins and minerals. So they're present in the diet in much smaller quantities, um, but they're also vitally important. So your macronutrients, let's talk about water a little bit. We often forget about that when we talk about protein, we talk about fat. Uh, water is one thing that's not going to be provided, say, much of in, in a dry kibble diet, but is really, really important to just overall canine health, especially for um, dogs that are living their lives active and outdoors. Um, this is responsible for maintaining and essential to all the cells in the body, all of those cellular processes. It doesn't provide any energy, but every single time that, um, you know, there's a cellular process in the body in metabolism, water is required to help that process move along. So not as it only going to aid in digestion and absorption of different nutrients. So those water soluble vitamins, vitamins can either be water soluble or fat soluble, the water soluble ones, the dog has to intake water to actually be able to uh, absorb all those vitamins. It's going to help transport nutrients around the body. Of course, it makes up blood, makes up um, all of the fluid that's inside cells and lubricates joints. It helps regulate and maintain body temperature. It's used in, of course, all those bodies, chemical reactions that we just talked about it helps remove waste from the body. So it is essential um, that we don't forget about water uh, as a, a very important macronutrient. And it's about 70% uh, of your average dog's lean body mass. So quite a bit. 
talking about ingredients and nutrients, I've said the word nutrients a lot. So those are the substances that the body actually requires to support life. Um, it's going to depend on the life stage and the different lifestyle of the animal, but those are those, you know, micro and macronutrients we talk about. Ingredients are just the raw materials that provide the nutrients. So ingredients really are the vehicle that allow us to get the nutrients into that dog. Ingredients matter a lot in that we want to focus on our ingredients based on what is the nutrient content of them. Um, are they palatable? Are they going to provide palatability to that diet? Uh, are they going to be digestible, especially when they're cooked correctly? Uh, digestibility actually goes up substantially. Um, and then there's consumer preferences. So your preferences too, um, that will kind of depend uh, or influence how ingredients are selected in certain diets. Protein in particular, we're talking about nutrients. Um, we thought we talk a lot about protein, fat, and carbohydrate. I think in, in working dogs and dogs that are outdoors and doing a job, we talk a lot about, you know, what is that optimal ratio of protein and fat in the diet? And we'll get into that too, but I first want to talk a little bit about protein quality. So there are essential amino acids that are required um, to be provided in the diet to the dog. They cannot make these on their own. Um, we have our own essential amino acids. Um, cats have different essential amino acids, taurine, which is basically be added to this list. Um, but you see here listed all the amino acids that need to be provided to a dog in its food. So that protein quality um, is not gonna be based on, you know, what's the source of that protein, but based on the content of the essential amino acids. It's also gonna be based on the bioavailability and digestibility of that protein source to free up those amino acids for the dog to use them um, and their individual amino acid requirement, which is basically how much more protein are they, are they uh, building in their body. So proteins are made up of these amino acids. Um, and so essentially, you know, if you feed a dog um, a hunk of beef, they break down all that protein that's in the beef to get the amino acids out and then they build their own protein out of those amino acids. Um, no one, what we think of say an, an animal protein source, those are gonna come, gonna come the closest to providing all the essential amino acids to a dog, but no one single protein source is going to be able to provide all of these essential amino acids in the ratio that is needed um, to be complete and balanced for that dog. So that's why we kind of combine different protein sources to get there. So the complementary proteins, this theory is where we take, you know, take a bunch of different protein sources within a diet, you know, whether it's chicken and soybean meal and everything else. Um, but some of those proteins essentially, and all of them really are going to be incomplete in that they're going to lack one or more of the essential amino acids in the appropriate amounts. So if we take, say, one that lacks lysine and methionine, we put those together in the right ratio, then we can supply all of the essential amino acids that are needed in that diet. So that's what we call high biological value. And that's why you'll see that pet foods use a combination of those different protein sources to contain all the adequate levels of essential amino acids. So things like chicken meal will be high in lysine and methionine, those two amino acids. Um, and soybean meal will be high in lysine, leucine, and tryptophan. They're low in methionine. So if we take, you know, corn gluten meal, which is actually kind of that innermost portion of that corn kernel, that's very high in protein, actually, um, corn gluten meal mixed with so soybean meal and chicken meal, and we put those together in the right ratio, then we get that nice complementary, complete protein that has a high biological value and provides all the essential amino acids that dog needs. Protein, of course, is essential for a few different reasons. Uh, it builds new tissues. You know, we think about protein being in muscle and protein being needed to build muscle. Um, but it's not just muscle, it's skin. It's that hair coat and organ development. So structurally, everything within the body contains proteins. Um, there needs to be about a minimal, a, ma a max, minimum, excuse me, of 25% of that metabolizable energy from protein. That's going to be different from the calorie level that's on, say, the, the bag of dog food that will look at, you know, certifying those calories and everything later on too. Uh, but the metabolizable energy will be a little different from what you're actually reading on the bag. So we'll look at, you know, how to read that on the bag and see, um, you know, what you think is going to be a, a good protein content. 
protein, um, high quality, of course, and needs to be highly digestible. Those are the very important things. So inadequate protein intake is actually gonna lead to uh, reduced resistance to toxic and infectious agents, uh, reduced resistance to parasites, reduced wound healing, um, because that skin actually isn't gonna be able to reform. The body's not gonna be able to make new skin, new proteins. Um, so have reduced wound healing. And then in um, juvenile animals, can actually lead to skeletal malformations, just like say an imbalance of calcium and phosphorus might. Um, so this is often reflected in a poor hair coat. Um, you know, if you're seeing it on the outside, I like to say the damage is definitely being done on the inside too. Carbohydrates are really interesting in that dogs are actually adapted more to consume carbohydrates. There's a study that was uh, published in uh, Nature magazine a few years ago um, that looked at basically the dog's salivary glands and um, the enzymes that they produce. They are specifically have genes that are encoded to produce enzymes to break down carbohydrates. A little bit different from say cats who are kind of more of our obligate carnivores and don't really require a carbohydrate source. They do find eating carbs, they don't really require one. Uh, but dogs are much more adapted to consume carbohydrates and, and two at, in comparison to their kind of wild counterparts too, so like coyotes and wolves and different species like that. But carbohydrates are really useful in that um, they have a protein sparing effect. And so that when you have a diet, it's got protein, fat and carbohydrates, if they're able to use the fat and the carbohydrates for energy, then they can actually use that protein to go build more muscle, um, to, to go through wound healing and build the immune system, those other things. Um, of course, when we're talking about reproduction, carbohydrates are actually needed for fetal development and lactose synthesis. So they're absolutely a requirement during gestational lactation. Um, and glucose will directly impact mothering as well. And so glucose is that byproduct, that breakdown of that carbohydrate, that starch. Um, so carbohydrates overall, very important inclusion inside a pet food. They're also a fiber source. Um, so they're important for digestive uh, health as well. Fats. So fats are one of my favorite things to talk about in dog food. Um, they're an energy source, of course, and they're kind of the most uh, energy rich energy source out of all of the, the things we talk about, protein, fat, and carbohydrates. Um, but unlike humans, dogs actually rely, their metabolism relies on fats primarily um, for energy during rest and during light to moderate intensity exercise. So an animal that is say like sprinting across a field um, he's gone mostly anaerobic and he's going to rely more on carbohydrates, but that dog that's just kind of steadily working all day long, their metabolism is primarily going to rely on fat and fatty acid oxidation to get energy. Higher levels of fat can actually metabolically condition an active dog's metabolism too. So they're develop, delivering more calories um, on a weight basis, say, than, than other sources are, but they're also helping to optimize that metabolism so it can run leaner. So a diet that skimps on fat is generally going to contribute to a reduction in endurance and overall fitness. Now, a diet, say, for your couch potato uh, dog might need to be a little bit more limited in fat so that they don't get overweight and obese, but for you know, working dogs, it's usually important to have uh, a higher fat content. Interestingly too, fat is metabolically a little bit what we call cooler than carbohydrates. So there is going to be less heat given off as that animal metabolizes that fat. Um, so they're going to produce less body heat as they're metabolizing fat versus say a carbohydrate. Fat, of course, as we know, it's going to deposit around the vital organs first. So that, you know, around the kidneys, um, that KPH fat, <laughs> the kidneys, the pelvic, the heart fat actually cushion those organs. So excess fat within the diet goes to those sources um, where we're talking about in the animal, not in the diet, of course. Um, it's going to then go under that outer layer of the skin. So they've got to have a good layer um, of fat on the skin, really, for you to know that they've got adequate cushioning and protection of their internal organs, say, if they get kicked. Um, or something else, they're gonna need that uh, protection. Number of other really important functions, taste, palatability, uh, that's a big one. Uh, and essential for digestion absorption of fat soluble vitamins, so that's A, D, E, and K. Uh, and then certain types are gonna be essential for growth and development, beneficial in osteoarthritis, things of that nature. 
Um, and then your omega-6, your little lenic acid actually is going to be really important in the skin barrier and keeping that intact um, and that barrier to parasites injury um, and actually evaporative water loss too. So to the question of, you know, do I need to feed a complete and balanced food every day? So cellular metabolism is really what I'm talking about when I say metabolism. So that's metabolism that's happening inside the cells on a, a second to second, sec, excuse me, second to second, minute to minute basis. So it's constantly going on and it requires the precursor compounds or what's been broken down out of the diet and stored up for later to always be available. So the body stores those and, and provides them for availability. When we're talking about, you know, the stores of say vitamins and minerals that can be used later on for functional things within the body, vitamin A can be stored for a long time. It's going to be about six months. Uh, arginine, one of those uh, amino acids that I mentioned earlier is going to be about three hours. Um, so, you know, lysine tryptophan, a little less than eight hours. Now in a well-nourished subject, uh, you're going to have a little bit of kind of fungibility with this uh, in terms of time. So you don't need to necessarily feed a dog every three hours to make sure that it has enough arginine. Um, every 24 hours is fine. Uh, generally, we're talking about these stores. But yes, it's not that you can feed, say, a complete and balanced diet, um, you know, th three days out of the week and feed something that's not complete and balanced four days out of the week and be fine. It really needs to be an everyday type of thing. When we're looking at assessing the actual animal, we look at those animal factors. Of course, you've got the age um, and its life stage, gender, neuter status, you know, is it neutered, is it intact? Uh, of course, in general, animal factors would be the species and then the breed of that animal, the activity level and the work. That's gonna where we focus most of our conversation on today. Health status, um, is it diseased? Um, is it injured? Is it healing? Is it repairing its body right now? Uh, it's existing body weight. And we'll look at, you know, what is its body condition score? And then what is its muscle condition score? Um, and then what is its appetite and food intake? Diet factors, of course, are going to include your complete dietary intake. So that's going to be, say, commercial pet food. Um, you know, what is that exactly? What are you feeding? If, are there any raw or home cooked foods that are added into that? Uh, any other treats or snacks or other foods, if you know, if you're out there treating the dogs, um, supplements and medications, but we kind of like to talk in a holistic um, type of, of space. We're talking about, you know, what is that complete dietary intake? What else might it be eating and finding when it's out working um, with the flock or with the herd? And then we look at that specific diet, we're talking about pet food, then, you know, what is the nutritional adequacy of that? Again, that AFCO statement, um, is it for the intended life stage? Is it completely balanced? Um, and then AFCO, excuse me, I, I should clarify, is the Association of uh, Feed Control Officials in the United States. It's not a regulatory body uh, federally, but it's made up of all the state regulators um, of animal feed and, and also pet food um, at that state level and others too. Nutritional adequacy is also going to be your quality assurance practices from the manufacturer. Um, so those are generally not dictated by anybody. Um, and then you also have to remember, you know, the expiration date is the food actually um, still good. Nutritional content of the diet itself, of course, caloric density, um, digestibility, digestibility, any alterations to the nutrient profile and the general nutrient profile that we're looking at there. Your feeding management factors are going to be, of course, like the amount that's fed and measuring that food out, um, the dog's uh, ability and time that it actually has to eat, the frequency of, of feeding and a meal time. Uh, is there competition? Are there shared food bowls? Uh, what's the location of the food in the water stations? Uh, food storage and contaminant control. Is the dog going to accept the diet? Um, you know, considering any recent changes in the environment and the social group, in their entire home environment, stress can play a huge factor in whether a dog's gonna go off of its food or not. Um, and then of course, you know, convenience, price point, all of those things are gonna come into play as well. So the goals for today that I, I kind of set out are, you know, understanding the nutritional needs for a dog, being able to do a nutrition assessment, understand nutritional needs, you know, be able on those dogs out in your herd to perform a, a body condition score and identify, say, those overweight, normal, and underweight animals, um, if you can. 
at least be able to locate that AFCO nutritional adequacy statement and caloric density of a selected pet food, select life stage appropriate nutrition, um, by and also determining that dog's caloric requirement and determine a recommended food amount for every meal. So that optimal nutrition should provide appropriate energy through calories, um, provide proper growth and maintenance with the balance of nutrients um, and support healthy uh, animals and thriving animals. Now, Bill, when I did this before, you're gonna have to tell me if y'all can hear this video because I forgot to optimize for sound, but this is a video that walks through body condition scoring and general assessment. So if it doesn't work, then I'll just kind of verbally walk us through it. But you let me know if y'all cannot hear this. Are you hearing any sound? No, we're not hearing anything, Dr. Stone. Okay. So I'll, I'll just pause that. We'll kind of walk through it. Uh, this, I think I had sent you the link to this video, Bill. It's on YouTube, so I can send it to you um, as well. But essentially, I'll just kind of walk us through as it goes. Uh, you evaluate the ribs, the waist of the animal, and you evaluate the apple. So you want to look at the ribs first, essentially. If you can on these dogs, you want to try to be able to touch them. Uh, I know this can be tough for some of them, but you should be able to at least with very gentle pressure, feel the ribs. Uh, you shouldn't be able to see the ribs in any of these dogs, not visibly. They should have a discernible waist. You see, she's looking at the kind of tuck of the waist um, and they should have a kind of tuck behind the abdomen. Now I know for a lot of your dogs kind of living in the heat of Texas, um, that they're outside and they're always on guard and they're stressed. You know, normally when, when as a, you know, a veterinary professional is looking at uh, a dog and doing a body condition score, they're often looking at an overweight animal. I know your situation is very different from that. Um, so when you're looking at it, say, you know, what does a dog look like when it's too lean, for instance? So this is where we talk about, and I, I kind of threw the cat chart on here too, in case you have any barn cats you might be interested in taking a look at or house cats. Um, but when we look actually at dogs, your dogs that are going to be in good body condition score on a scale of one with one being emaciated and nine being really obese are going to be fours and fives. And most working dogs are really going to sit more at that level of a four, um, especially, you know, in those times where they may drop down and get really, really lean. So when we're looking at actually, you know, doing a body condition score for an animal, we're trying to figure out where on the scale does it fit. So a one, an emaciated dog is going to have short coated, at least very visible ribs. Um, it's going to have the vertebrae in its back actually be visible and sticking up. You're going to be able to see its pelvic bones um, and all these bony prominences are going to be evident from a distance. In comparison to that, when you're looking at a dog that's say a four, when you apply very gentle pressure, you should be able to palpate those ribs, to feel the ribs if you just kind of slide your hands over its thorax. They shouldn't be protruding, but you should be able to feel them with very gentle pressure. And so what I like to say um, for that is if you hold your hand out flat um, and then just kind of let your fingers relax a little bit, if you're pressing in gently, you should be able to feel some of those protrusions you shouldn't be able to feel it as if you had a fist. That is, that's too thin. That's definitely in the three range, if not more. Um, but you do want them to have a pretty evident abdominal tuck and then a waist from the top. So you wanna have a little tuck here and then a waist from the top. This is gonna be dependent too on the breed of the dog. So some of those deeper chested dogs that have a really nice kind of tuck up behind the waist, um, they're gonna be more pronounced with that tuck than um, say, you know, for instance, this Labrador here, they don't really have quite so much of that tuck up behind the waist naturally. Um, you don't want a ton of excess fat covering. Um, you don't want to get into this territory where we start to lose those tucks and kind of have lots of soft, soft curves. Um, but we definitely don't want them down here where there is just no palpable fat. You don't want them too, too lean. You want them more in this four range. And so Purina basically came up with that nine point scale. We came up with that with what's called the World Small Animal Veterinary Association. We did this based on um, 
And we know that that four and those five are the best based on a lifespan study that we perform. And so kind of trying to keep this short, there are 48 uh, paired litter mate Labrador retrievers that were randomly assigned into different feeding groups. Um, they were fed all the same complete and balanced diet. They only the amount of food differed. The control group, what we call the control group, um, was fed uh, for maintenance for ideal body condition. Um, they were allowed to eat as much as they wanted out of that maintenance amount. And the lean fed group was actually fed 25% uh, less than that. And this was a study that went on for their entire lives. And so I just want to show y'all, you know, when we're looking at these dogs at six years old, this is a dog from the lean fed group. And then this is a dog from uh, the control group that was allowed kind of that free feeding out of that maintenance amount. At 10 years old, this is what they look like. And what we actually found is that feeding to an ideal body condition throughout their life extended that median lifespan by an average of 1.8 years. Um, so median lifespan for that control fed dog was about 11.2. The median lifespan for a lean fed dog was 13. We also found that there um, was a significant delay in when those dogs got osteoarthritis and other chronic conditions that required treatment. Um, so really nice results. And again, we're on the obesity side of things um, and showing that leaner dogs generally live uh, a bit longer, healthier lives. But that's essentially where those, um, those numbers and how we know that, where that comes from. So sporting and working dogs are no different in that they generally perform best when they're maintained in lean body condition. It's going to be a four to five out of nine. A lot of times it's going to be more of a four. Um, you want to regularly monitor that body conditions for that BCS. So that's going to be that ribs, waist, and tummy tuck. I'm going to adjust the food as needed to keep the dogs from getting too thin or too heavy. Um, you might need to feed more. They might need a more energy dense diet too, because volume can limit uh, basically the nutrition that we get into that animal. Um, so if you're going out, you're assessing the herd, assess those dogs as well um, and make sure that they're looking like they're going to be capable of doing their jobs. Calories might need to be again adjusted seasonally or based on the level of work that's expected of them in a given season. Not all active dogs are going to need what's called a performance dog food. Um, so, you know, Purina makes a sport dog food. We'll look at that in a bit. Uh, but really a lot of active and, and working and sporting dogs, especially if they're not really going really nose to the grindstone, are just going to need a high quality, highly digestible adult maintenance food that's balanced with moderate fat, protein, and carbs. Um, now, you're going to be the only one who can know exactly what those dogs are going to need. And that's kind of based off of personal history and seeing, you know, what, what additional might they need from, from here. Uh, palatability of course is really important because if the dogs won't eat it, um, it's not going to matter. So you want it to be palatable to make them want to eat. Uh, you want it to be digestible and bioavailable too. So your endurance activities and heavy work are going to require formulas actually that are higher um, in fat and protein. So for a true endurance dog, um, in, as an example, so Dr. Arlie Reynolds is a veterinarian who actually works up at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Um, and he has uh, a, a population, he uses these dogs um, for some research on uh, working dogs and sporting dogs and very athletic dogs. He has a population um, of very, very active uh, mushing sled dogs. And so sometimes, so those dogs are racing, they will take in an enormous number of calories, yes, but their diet will also be maybe even 35% fat. Uh, so on a dry matter basis, which is going to be significantly higher than really any of the diets that you would be looking at for a dog that isn't running, um, you know, 12 hours a day or more. And what about water? Okay, so we talked a little bit about that. Always, if and when possible, should be abundant and available. Uh, dehydration absolutely reduces performance um, and exercise. Hydration is extremely important and exercise is heat producing. Uh, water is required to dissipate heat. You know, dogs pant. Dogs don't necessarily sweat, but they lose water as they pant through what we call evaporative losses. And all exercising dogs are going to require more water than a dog that's at rest. Um, they lose water quickly during that panting process. The amount of water required by an exercising dog is going to depend on the body weight, um, the ambient temperature, and the humidity efficiency of that evaporative water loss. So how much they're losing, they're going to need to replace that um, and the exercise duration and intensity. Um, but both extreme cold and heat increase water requirements. It's not just when it's hot outside. 
um, that cellular metabolism is going to increase and require more water um, as it's cold out and those dogs are trying to warm themselves up. Um, but as a, just as a point to note, dogs don't lose electrolytes like humans do when we sweat or like a horse does necessarily, they lose that water during evaporative heat. So we're really focused mostly on replacing water, uh, not necessarily replacing salts. Just as an aside, I wanted to, to let you guys know there is another kind of body condition score that you can do called a muscle condition scoring system. Um, this is typically something that you would use in a very, you know, older animal um, or a diseased animal to look at muscle loss. Um, and it typically has to deal kind of with actually looking at the bony protrusions to of the skin. But typically, this is something that you would serve for some of those older dogs. And since I don't want to run short on time, I'm going to kind of move on a little bit here. Fecal score, I know you guys probably aren't out there looking around at the dog's poop too much, uh, but just so you know, we're all on the same kind of page here, a score out of two is what we would consider normal. We definitely don't wanna be seeing fours, uh, you know, five, sixes and, and sevens uh, on a regular basis. So if you do happen to, to observe this, um, a dog that is eating a good high quality digestible diet is gonna have a nicely formed stool. Uh, when you're out there assessing the animals, you might, you know, happen to observe other nutritional responsive problems, um, things like dental disease, things like skin disease, things like joint disease. Um, dental disease and that oral health actually can play a huge role, of course, as you would think, um, in, you know, whether that dog is going to be able to eat efficiently and whether it's going to be able to do its job. So skill number two, you know, talk about here is determining the life stage of the animal. This is where we're actually going to get kind of into the more brass tacks of pet food. So first, we've got a couple of different, you know, words that we can call out and talk about. So different life stages as designated by APCO. Um, we'll think about growth. That is for puppies. So that's when we think about a puppy. It's not yet an adult. Adult maintenance. Uh, reproduction, which is your gestation and lactation. That's another life stage. Senior and geriatric, while we might actually be able to tweak nutrition for them in certain ways to optimize it for those dogs, uh, they're not technically defined by AFCO. So, you know, when you read an AFCO statement, and we'll get into that, you know, if it says growth, if it says adult maintenance, um, if it says reproduction, or if it says all life stages, we know that those are actually APCO terminology. If a, a bag says, you know, senior geriatric on the front, then that is something else that the company has done. Um, it's not necessarily within those APCO standards. So we're kind of trying to designate, you know, what's the difference between growth and what's the difference between growth and adult maintenance? Anything that's still in the growth phase should be eating a puppy food. And it's gonna have some, some subtle differences um, sometimes in protein and fat content, but especially in calcium and phosphorus ratio, things like that, in, especially in your large breed puppies, um, that make it important for them to eat a puppy food versus an adult food. So when is it okay to transition that puppy to an adult food? That's what we call skeletal maturity. So in your small to medium breed dogs, that's going to be more, you know, eight to 12 months. Anything that is a large breed, say over, you know, in that 50 to 100 pound range is going to be pretty much up to about a year and a half or so is the general rule of thumb that I go by. And your giant breed dogs, anything really that's well over 100 pounds, you might not want to switch them over to an adult food until they're, you know, 18 months to 24 months old, actually. So two years sometimes. Um, and it's generally speaking, it's perfectly fine for an adult dog to eat a puppy food, um, but the reverse is not always true. So the puppies need to be eating something that we see that AFCO statement say growth on it um, or all life stages um, and not say adult maintenance if it's going to be fed to young animals. So where do you actually go to locate this information? Okay, so what are you looking for? Where are you going to look for it? Um, what you're looking for is first that AFCO nutritional adequacy statement. Um, you also want the manufacturer's name and contact information um, to be able to call them and ask some questions if you want to. Um, and then the caloric density is important as well. Um, and then also, of course, that guaranteed analysis chart. You can find it on um, brand websites, that's supposed to say, not, not websites. Uh, and of course, the food bag, the bag itself tells you a lot of information. So that AFCO nutritional adequacy statement is one of the most important pieces um, that we'll talk about. There can be a lot of information on a pet food label. 
So in North America, um, there are a, a lot of regulations. We're required to list out all the ingredients. Now this is descending um, by weight basis. So you'll notice if you read the ingredients on a bag of pet food, um, if it includes say whole meat, uh, that'll often be the first ingredient because that includes a lot of water that's actually going to get dehydrated out while that is made into a pet food. If it includes, say, a dehydrated meat meal, like a chicken meal, that's often going to be lower down the list than the carbohydrates. Um, they'll provide the same nutritional value. They'll just be in different places on the ingredient deck uh, because of what they weigh when they go into the pet food, essentially. And a ton of other information is on there as well, but your guaranteed analysis is gonna be important. This of course is a cat food example. Um, so we wouldn't necessarily see this amount of protein in the dog food, because again, cats are obligate carnivores and require more. But that APCO nutritional adequacy statement. So this is the food, uh, any food in question needs to have an APCO adequacy statement on its label. If it does not have the APCO nutritional adequacy statement, I personally would not purchase that food. Um, that is, you know, one of the things that can actually tell us that this is appropriate for uh, a dog and a cat. And, you know, it's not necessarily uh, required to, to follow these standards. So a statement confirms three important things to you. So whether it's complete and balanced, which is what you want, um, or if it's intended for supplemental feeding only. A treat, for example, like a begging strip is going to say supplemental feeding only because it's not supposed to be the sole source of nutrition. I'm just going to say the life stage the food is intended to be fed for, so either growth, adult maintenance, uh, reproduction, or all life stages. I um, mean, reproduction can say lactation, gestation. If the food is complete and balanced, how did the company actually determine that? So labels might include one of two statements, and that's going to be um, either feeding trials or formulation, so formulated to meat. Complete and balanced means just that. So when we're reading that label, uh, it really just does tell us that it's going to be uh, basically telling you that that is the can be the sole source of nutrition for that animal. It's going to meet its caloric needs, it's going to meet all its nutrient requirements. That basis of the APCO statement, again, can either be formulated to meet nutritional levels. So that's basically looking at what's been published by APCO, um, and then formulating that diet to meet all of those numerical values for all the nutrients that are in it. Um, and then animal feeding tests, we'll talk about that in a bit, but you're either going to do that for, you know, the appropriate life stage is either going to be say for growth, including or excluding word free puppies for maintenance, for gestation, lactation, or for all life stages. So when we're looking at, you know, feeding trial and test duration. So for this, you know, example, you'll read this on a label as animal feeding test using APCO procedures substantiate that product Y. Uh, we'll say the, the pet food company and the, and the diet provides complete and balanced nutrition for maintenance of adult dogs. Um, so this is an animal feeding test example. Um, APCO doesn't do these feeding tests. The company actually has to do them and they can take a long time. They can be expensive. Um, adult maintenance has to be at least 26 weeks in duration. And that's how long you have to actually feed the diet to these dogs. Of course, they're undergoing, um, it's not an invasive process at all. They get to eat tasty dog food, of course. Um, but we, you know, do take blood work. Um, we do uh, examinations on the animals. We make sure basically that they're thriving on the food. We do a lot of labs with it too. For a growth claim on a diet, you actually have to start with weaned puppies but under eight weeks of age um, or nine weeks for a kitten. And then you have to continue that out for at least 10 weeks. Uh, large breed puppy growth is a new call out um, per AFCO as of 2017. So you'll see that most labels by now have started to shift over and use if it's approved for dogs over 70 pounds and above, they'll specifically call that out on the label now because uh, that's required. Uh, if it's for gestation or lactation, you've got to start at or before estrus um, until four weeks postpartum. Uh, and you monitor not just the litter, but you monitor the bitch as well. All life stages is the longest trial because not only, excuse me, do you do the reproduction and the growth, but you're also looking at that and wrapping that up into adult maintenance as well. So that is a very long, um, pretty expensive trial. Not every single dog food needs to have a feeding trial. Formulated to meat um, is, is quite appropriate. I like to see that a company is doing both though, because if they're doing both, the learnings from the feeding trial are 
basically going to be able to bleed over into um, the formulated to need. So those learnings and that, that knowledge is going to apply more so to both. So I like to see a mix of feeding trials um, and formulated to need. And you'll typically find that kind of hidden somewhere in that small print on the bag down there, as we can see on the back of this adult shredded blend beef and rice formula from Purina, um, that the animal feeding test is kind of on that lower left. And you're also gonna see our name and phone number um, down there on the right. And in the center here, you see all of this, including the caloric density um, on a kilogram basis and on a per cup basis um, with that guaranteed analysis. If you're looking at a brand website, should be listed out on our website, it's tabs. So if you go look at it, you'll notice that there's a nutrition tab, a feeding information tab, um, when you're looking at one particular diet, but you can find it there as well. So this is a question, um, I'll answer it just for the sake of time, um, but I'll let you look at this too. You know, if, the, if a puppy and an adult dog is eating a complete and balanced diet that's appropriate for their life stage, are they gonna require supplementation with anything else? Vitamins, with calcium and phosphorus, um, and with protein or anything like that. And I think the, the most common one that I'll get is that people wanna supplement, say a large breed puppy's food with calcium and phosphorus, which actually is the exact wrong thing to do um, and can lead to a lot more problems with bone growth uh, than, than we would ever like to see. Um, for large breed dogs in particular, it's very important that they grow slowly um, so that their bones are able to grow at an appropriate slow rate. And one part doesn't get faster or speed up or um, essentially kind of get ahead of the rest of it and that growth plate closure occurs uh, at the right time. So as long as they're eating a complete and balanced diet, um, you do not need to supplement with anything as long as it's appropriate for that life stage of either growth, maintenance, or that reproductive stage. Um, and remembering that your all life stages claim is gonna encompass everything. So when we look at, you know, all of this is kind of nebulous so far. And so we talked a little bit about, you know, protein and fat contents and, and caloric density. It's all gonna depend on your individual dog. So when you're talking about, you know, the dogs, the, the sled dogs in Alaska, a lot of times the food that they eat, you know, they might need to have a, a food that's 600 calories per cup. And some of the field trial dogs that, that I see when I'm working with our sporting dog group, um, they might be more on say the, the five to 550 uh, calories per cup, um, which is pretty dense. And generally you only need that during periods of heavy work. It's gonna be kind of too much uh, maybe in the off season or when that animal's not working so much. Um, but what we want to focus on is that if you're, you know, if you're looking at these dogs and you're trying to, to look at, you know, what is the appropriate protein fat content for them? I wanted to pull up an example of dog chow, um, cause it's, it's a great diet. It can be appropriate for a number of different dogs. And if they're not, um, working too, too hard, then for a lot of instances, this is going to be a great diet. Um, your protein minimum, and now remember we talked about how it's going to be a, a difference in that kind of metabolic that we talked about at the beginning, um, that protein minimum in dog chow example is going to be 21%. Your crude fat uh, minimum is going to be 10%. For the, I say the majority of dogs are actually out actively working really hard. This isn't going to be enough. This is good for, you know, a lot of um, kind of those lighter work periods, um, less moderate intensity kind of work. Um, but for a lot of those dogs that are working harder, not necessarily going to be enough um, to get them by. So there's a high protein option. Um, Purina dog chow, of course, and I'm going to use this as an example. Protein at a minimum is 27%. Um, that crude fat is going to be at, say, 12%. This is probably more on par with what a working dog is going to require in its, its daily life. If we want to kind of switch Purina brands for a second. We look at just kind of your, I call this, you know, your general good pro plan uh, dog food. It's not necessarily designed for a, for a specially active dog. Um, it's just a different brand within the line. This is going to be a 26, 12. So 26% fat, 12%, uh, 26% protein, 12% fat diet, that's going to be great for a lot of dogs. When I'm looking at a dog um, that is say a field trial lab or a pointer during hunting season, a lot of those dogs are going to be eating what we call pro plan performance formulas or pro plan sport. So that's going to be a 30, 20 formula. 
Uh, we also make a 2717 formula and we make a, another 3017 formula for some of the, the older dogs that don't need quite so much fat content. Uh, but this is more on par with what a very, very active dog would need. We'll come back to this in a second when we talk a little bit more about, you know, what, what is the actual determination of work that you might wanna be looking at. Um, but just as an aside, you know, we had mentioned that selecting the best pet food or, you know, the best food for the dog also involves, you know, the manufacturer's name and contact information. So this actually allows you um, to ask some questions that are also important, um, such as, you know, do you imply a full-time animal nutritionist? Um, and I want to see a company employ veterinary nutritionists and also PhD animal nutritionists specialized in dogs um, that are working full time for the company. I want those people to have a very strong hand in actually formulating the diet. So these individuals, um, in particular for a veterinarian, they do a residency three to four years after veterinary school to specialize in animal nutrition and what it takes to formulate a diet. Do they perform ACO feeding trials or do uh, they formulate to meet, to meet those ACO nutrient profiles? Where are they produced and manufactured? What are the specific quality control measures that we look at and how do they ensure consistency and quality? And then would they provide a complete nutrient analysis for the dog or say cat food in question? What's the caloric value and what kind of product research has been conducted? Research on that product and then research on other products. Um, Purina also has um, a veterinary therapeutic line that I mentioned already um, for pets with very specific health conditions to help mitigate those. Um, and we actually publish in peer reviewed journals and, and work with researchers, you know, within Purina and at universities and veterinary universities across the country um, and internationally to actually publish research in journals um, on health conditions and on kind of the nutritional means of mitigating those. But a little bit more brass tacks. The question is, you know, you kind of have a loose idea in your mind probably about what your particular um, dogs might need, how much protein, how much fat, how much they're actually out there working, um, what they might actually require, probably more in that upper fat range of say a 15 to 20 percent and around that kind of 26 or 25 percent protein to 30 percent protein range. Um, generally is going to be more for uh, what we would consider appropriate for a working dog. Maybe not, maybe they're gonna be fine on um, something like a 12% fat or anywhere from like a 15 to a 17% uh, protein, but you still gotta know how much to feed. So generally, you know that when you're, you're looking at resources, they're all gonna start on your average healthy dog, which is not generally a working dog. Um, but Bill, I don't know if I had sent this resource to you, but I can send this one um, to share with everybody as well. This is going to go off of, you know, an average, say, healthy dog that is not doing a ton of work is, you know, say if it needs 55 pounds, generally it's going to need about 940 to uh, 1174 calories a day. And then kilocalorie um, is just the, we say calorie, but it's actually technically a kilocalorie. So when you see a kilocalorie, just think calories. Um, so that dog's maybe going to need about a thousand calories a day. Now we can go up even higher than that, but that's not necessarily for a working dog. That's just a general dog. So how active is active, right? So the energy needs of working and sporting dogs are going to vary really widely. Every activity has unique performance requirements for every individual dog. It's going to vary required vary a lot. Um, and those anticipated energy requirements can help us to kind of, you know, wrap our brains a lot around it a little bit more if we think about um, low, moderate, and high. So if you think about, you know, a dog that's just doing, say, dock jumping or agility work, those are generally pretty low increase. So that's going to be 25% or less increase in the energy needs that we just looked at. So, you know, you would take this number and then tackle on up to 25% of that. Your moderate work is going to be, say, a dog that's carting for, you know, up to 10 miles or so. A lot of your feed, field trial dogs, hunting less than three hours, search and rescue, that can be anywhere from, you know, a 25% increase to 100% or actually doubling the caloric intake uh, that they need. Uh, sled dog racing course, less than 20 miles, um, high activity service. I would estimate that probably most of your dogs during the majority of their work would kind of probably fall more into that moderate calorie uh, moderate work range, but again, it's going to vary widely. And then you've got your dogs that are out there hunting, say for six hours at a time, racing for over 20 miles, carting over 10 miles. And depending on how much work your dogs are putting in the field, some of them might actually fall into that category as well. 
Um, and they might at different times. I was gonna talk a little bit about this, but I think I'm gonna skip it for time's sake. Basically, this is just all the calculations that we've got to do to go into figuring out those, those calorie calculations um, that we talked about before. Um, but really when we're looking at, you know, work, we can look at say probably that anywhere from, you know, 25 to hundred percent or even more. Um, and that's in a resource that I, I shared with Bill and I know he's, uh, he'd be happy to share with y'all. Um, when we're looking at increasing, say those average, uh, calorie numbers for, you know, your average dog, you know, look at your dog's weight, look at how much the average dog of that weight would need. Think about how much work your dogs do and then tack that on in addition to it. So just a couple of quick things as we finish up here, um, just general rules of thumb. I know every situation is different in an ideal world. Um, all these dogs would be able to kind of feed in an, in an established location. They would be eating undisturbed. Um, but you know, if you were able to, um, to the best of your ability, I would say if you, it's probably, uh, to make sure that they're able to get that nutrition, um, best to try to have them feed in an established location. If they're coming back to that location every day, um, try to allow them some time to eat where they're going to be undisturbed um, from each other. Um, that includes competition. And then, of course, we know sometimes sheep and goats like to kind of nibble on the dog food, too. So if we're considering things like self feeders um, and you're not around uh, and, you know, the flock's trying to get into it, you can consider barriers to that as well. Um, other animals that might be out there trying to get the food. Uh, of course, we need to think about the, the other things that we're asking these dogs to guard that flock against, um, trying to, to, to grab in and, and get that dog food. But feeding a high quality, moderate, high protein and fat diet uh, appropriate for that animal's needs and life stage. Um, and remembering, of course, digestibility, bioavailability and palatability being really high because Palatability can, I think, go miles in actually getting these dogs to eat um, and a lot of times when they otherwise might not. Um, temperature, of course, we all know that when it's hot outside, dogs don't like to eat too much. Um, so that has an effect on appetite. Uh, it also has an effect on caloric needs too. Um, temperature, you know, I'm a vet, so I got to throw some extra stuff in here. Um, heat stroke, of course, is something um, to be mindful of. Um, and cold exposure too. And don't, don't downplay the needs for hydration during cold exposure. Um, parasitism, this can impact and can also be impacted by nutrition. Um, that's your GI parasites, heart wound disease, external parasites as well. Um, but a, a dog that's well nourished is going to be a little bit better able to kind of fight off at least the GI parasites and the external. Unfortunately, all the nutrition in the world is not going to prevent heartworm disease. Um, only your heartworm preventives are going to be able to do that. Um, but a, you know, it, it's going to be a lot more apparent in a dog that's parasitized that is, um, poorly nourished to start with, um, that they're doing poorly. Um, musculoskeletal injuries, of course, you know, those can come from repetitive motions, overuse, your general sprains and strains, um, things like that. Nail, foot, bat, and paw injuries, torn nails, cups, and scrapes, all these are going to heal faster in a dog that has better nutrition on board. Um, also injuries sustained in the line of duty, um, whether it's from the flock or whether it's from, you know, those coyotes or anything else that's out there. Um, and then toxin exposure as well. So basically we're, we're talking about that resilience concept. Wanted to call out some general resources. Of course, you have Bill and the team at AgriLife Research. Um, Purina.com has a number of different articles. Um, we're talking specifically about working uh, dogs though. I like to go read the Pro Club articles. So um, if you just type into a web browser, basically Purina Pro Club, you'll be taken um, and you can find a, a, a number of good articles there on working dog nutrition. Uh, Tufts Vet School has a web page called Pet Foodology. That's a great resource um, to, to go look for just kind of general concepts. And then I talked about a bunch of questions that you can ask pet food manufacturers too. Uh, but there is a group called Pet Nutrition Alliance that is made up um, of a number of um, well-respected groups within the animal nutrition space um, that actually calls manufacturers, asks for those questions, and then publishes them in the manufacturer report. So if you're curious to look into any of that, um, that is a resource that you're you know, more than welcome uh, to go reference there at that Dare to Ask manufacturer report too. And with that, I think I've eaten up all my time for questions because I, I love talking about this stuff um, and I am happy to stick around and answer more questions that you'll have. Um, but wanted to say again, thank you for you know listening to me for a full hour. I didn't think I was going to talk that long, but I did. Uh, but happy to stick around and answer questions and, and hope you all might have some time as well. 
Well, thank you, Dr. Stump. Um, we do have some questions um, in the mm -hmm. chat box here. Uh, the first one was, what were your, or what are your thoughts on working dogs eating raw um, food? Um, I, I think a raw diet is what they were referring yeah, to. I generally try to avoid that. Um, there are, I mean, not just from a veterinary perspective, I mean, there are a number of reasons why we want to avoid that bacterial contamination being number one. Um, you know, we can't prevent what they're going to eat while they're out there uh, in the wild, but I wouldn't want to be feeding anything on a regular basis that I know could actually introduce um, pathogenic bacteria um, into, into a dog's environment and, and put them at risk. Uh, the next one is, uh, they see many dry dog foods with the first ingredient of grain or corn product. Um, you know, they try to pick one that, that has, um, I'm assuming animal protein as a first product. Okay. Um, you know, what, what's, I guess, your recommendation on that? Yeah. So that all goes back to what we were talking about before. When we look at that ingredient deck, all of those ingredients are listed by weight. So when you see something, we talk about, you know, corn is the first ingredient. It's not, not a bad thing. Um, corn is a really high, when it's cooked appropriately uh, in, in, in most kibble, and I can I speak for Purina, at least for us, it's cooked appropriately. It's a really highly digestible energy source. So that provides that protein sparing effect. So that dog can actually use that protein for other sources. Um, it spares the fat to provide, you know, more of that energy source. And so carbohydrates are actually really nutrient dense as well, not just in providing energy, but in providing essential vitamins and minerals. Um, and when we talked about say corn gluten meal actually can be very high in protein too. And so, you know, if there's a carbohydrate is the first ingredient, that just means it's the heaviest ingredient when it went in. Um, usually what you'll see then is that it, those protein sources um, that we think of as protein sources might be a little further down the list. That just means that they weighed less overall. If you see that, you know, whole meat chicken is the first ingredient, um, you know, that's perfectly fine as well, but that just means that whole muscle meat went into that diet and whole muscle meat, you know, we talked about, you know, our dogs are about 70% water. Well, most mammalian species are about 70% water. So you've actually got to take all that water out to make a kibble. If you put in something that's already dehydrated, like a chicken meat meal, it weighs a lot less because we already took the water out. So you'll see whole meat chicken is say that first ingredient because it's got a lot of water in it. You'll see something like a chicken meat meal lower down the ingredient deck because it doesn't have that water when it goes into the, the pet food. Does that make sense? Hey, so, um, I, cause that's a question I get a lot of times. Mm -hmm. Um, so basically yep. it doesn't necessarily mean that there's less of the, for yep. instance, chicken meal in the, in the, the kibble, right. yep. it just didn't weigh as much as for Go instance, ahead. the corn was. Exactly. And that points back to the nutrition, the nutrients that actually go into it. And so we look at that ingredient deck, you know, we can think a lot of different things and we didn't even talk about how there are a lot of words for say vitamins and minerals, legally pet food companies have to call them by specific names. Um, and that's all regulated. Uh, but you can only put certain names of things on uh, a pet food bag. And some of those, they, are, they look like foreign words, but they're just the chemical names for say, you know, vitamin A um, or vitamin E and things like that. So ingredient decks um, can, can speak to us in, in ways we probably shouldn't let them at times. Uh, and it's all about the nutrients that go into the food through those ingredients uh, that matter the most, not necessarily in what order they're in, um, and just know that, you know, as long as you're there, you're getting that AFCO statement that says it's complete and balanced for the life stage that you're looking for, they're getting all of the nutrients out of that food through the ingredients that were put into it, um, to be complete and balanced. Um, so the next question is, what exactly is chicken meal, for instance, or beef meal or Yep. So that is basically, if you think about, you know, chicken or beef as, um, you know, a meat product that is basically those parts that are ground up and usually dehydrated. Um, so that water is taken out. So basically it's just that part of the processing was done prior to it being included in the pet food um, or included in say the, I should say in the production process of the pet food um, versus, you know, a chicken or a beef. A meal just means basically it's been ground up and dehydrated. Um, and then, you know, this wasn't, the question that was asked, but a lot of times we'll, you know, also ask me, you know, what is a byproduct? 
um, those are things that typically aren't going to make it onto the plate at your steakhouse. Um, and so we think about meat and protein sources and other things as being kind of the muscle meats of, you know, cattle or, or hens or, or other things. Um, but a lot of times if we, if we watch how say a, in an omnivore or a carnivore dog or cat out in the wild, is actually going to eat, um, a, a prey species that it's taken down. It's going to go for the internal organs first. Um, that's where the most nutrient dense tissues are with the vitamins and the minerals, um, also really, really good protein sources. And so a byproduct are simply those things like kidneys and like the heart, uh, that typically aren't going to make it onto our plates. Um, but we find kind of a, a viable path for them in the marketplace, in our pet foods, and also help in providing a natural source of vitamins and minerals. Um, so a little less of the, you know, vitamin and mineral premix might need to be used, for instance. Uh, so the next question is, uh, how good are dental treats for dogs? Depends on the dental treat, depends on how uh, frequently you're giving it. It says, <laughs> I'm going to laugh a little bit here. So in an, in an ideal veterinary world, um, the recommendation is to brush your pet's teeth once a day. So I know that that is obviously not something that we're considering for this population of dogs. Um, and they're also not pets. Um, so you probably don't want to go, you know, running out there and brushing their teeth every single night. Um, no dental treat is going to remove any of the calculus that's already built up. Um, they can help reduce tartar. So the stages, say, of dental decay are going to go through, you kind of get a, what would we call biofilm that forms on the teeth um, throughout the day. Um, and that's just generally kind of the bacteria that are, you know, eating whatever's left from that, you know, food inside the mouth. And you get tartar that builds up. And then over time, that calcifies in the calculus. Um, so a dental tree isn't necessarily going to remove anything that's already built up there. It can help prevent or delay some of that build up um, more so of, of additional things in the future. And so I would say, if you're going to start with dental treats, um, maybe this is a dog that can at, at times let you brush its teeth. I don't know. I'm going to leave that up to you all. Uh, but you know, it's better to start earlier than uh, after you've already started to see issues occur. Um, if you're already starting to see a lot of calculus build up, really, it's going to be too late for um, a dental treat to do any work. Um, professional dental cleaning at a veterinarian would be able to take all that calculus off and kind of set them back to basics, at which point you could start, um, say, a reasonable dental um, treat program. Um, Purina makes dentist sticks. Those work pretty well. Um, there's a number of different things on the market. Um, I generally don't really like uh, water additives. I know there are water additives uh, on the market. I don't like the, you know, the constant ingestion um, of that kind of going into the dog's body. It's a personal philosophy. Um, but, you know, dental treats generally more as a preventative than a uh, treatment mechanism. Okay. <laughs> the next question, why are ingredients split on an ingredient label? Not sure what that. I'm first. not sure I understand that one. Mm. I don't know. Uh, Taylor, if you're still on, uh, maybe you can clarify that for us. I'm going to move on to the, the next question here. Um, probiotics and prebiotics, yes or no? Yes, but proceed with caution. So Purina makes Fortiflora. Uh, Fortiflora is pretty widely available at say Walmart, Tractor Supply, other things like that. That is a probiotic that we actually have done, I don't know, 50 plus studies on um, for a number of different things. Diarrhea being one of them, immune support being another one. But we actually have published research studies in, in medical journals and veterinary medical journals showing the benefits of that uh, in, in diarrhea resolution, uh, in immune stimulation and immune support. Um, so that's a proven product. We also know that we have a, you know, a proprietary actually, uh, encapsulation process so that when the animal eats that probiotic it actually starts breaking down in that stomach acid, but it gets to the intestine so it can actually do its job. Um, there's actually been studies done on uh, probiotics that are on the marketplace. The important thing to remember is that Probiotics are basically what fall into the supplements category. So any supplement, you know, whether it's intended to be given to an animal or given to a human, um, they're not 
regulated by the FDA. There's no regulatory body in the federal government like there would be, say, uh, in, in our food supply um, that actually are in medications that tells us, you know, exactly or, and regulates the company making that product that what they say is on the label actually has to be in there in the quantity that is in there. And in the case of probiotics has to be alive and also able to make it to the gut to do its job. And so studies that are actually done on probiotics that are available on the marketplace um, show us that by and large, um, the vast majority, and I, I can't do the, the calculation really quickly in my head, but there were two products, Portaflora being one of them that actually passed muster on this trial of about 25 or so different products that was done um, that actually contain what they said they contain in the quantities that could be grown out on a plate. Um, so unfortunately, whatever is in a majority of probiotics out there either isn't there to begin with, um, is dead, uh, or isn't going to survive stomach acid to actually make it to the intestine. So just make sure that you can trust the manufacturer and that, you know, they've done research and published research on the veracity of that product. It can be very, very helpful. Um, uh, but if you can't verify that no one else is verifying it. Um, so then at that point, you just be kind of throwing your money down the drain, unfortunately. Prebiotics um, and probiotics are those live bacteria, right? They can do a, a ton of really good stuff for the gut, for the immune system. Um, when we kind of meet those parameters I just mentioned, prebiotics would be fiber sources, um, usually available in a food. Um, so in Purina foods, there are gonna be a number of different fiber types uh, that are in there that function as prebiotics. So these are basically um, fibers that make it to the uh, large intestine intact where the good bacteria that already live there um, and then potentially the probiotic that you're providing as well are gonna be able to ferment those. Um, that produces short chain fatty acids. Um, so we think about our ruminants, we think about short chain fatty acids and those microbes in the gut kind of chomping down on you know whatever they're eating and producing, propionate, um, butyrate, and acetate. Same thing happens in uh, for those prebiotic fibers, the soluble fibers in the gut of uh, dogs. And so if we feed them those fibers, good bacteria are then going to ferment those fibers, produce those short chain fatty acids. Those are gonna directly feed the colonocytes and the other cells lining the gut wall, um, increase the surface areas, absorptive ability, overall lead to a kind of positive, healthier gut. So both pre and probiotics together can be really, really powerful. Um, um. Oh, the next question, do you have any specific feeding recommendations for a livestock guardian dog who already has hip dysplasia? Mm. That one, it's going to depend on the individuals. Uh, you know, it's going to depend on the individual animals, general age, other health status, otherwise. Generalized recommendation for a hip dysplasia, I would definitely talk with your veterinarian of record who knows that dog, um, talk with them about specifics. Um, but in general, hip dysplasia can predispose an animal to osteoarthritis. Um, Omega-3 fatty acids like fish oils can be beneficial in treatment of osteoarthritis or in helping mitigate uh, at least the clinical signs of that. They're very anti-inflammatory um, and glucosamine. So those would be kind of some of the number one things that I might consider um, for a dog that has say osteoarthritis due to hip dysplasia. Wouldn't want to make any specific recommendations for anybody without knowing the actual case. Um, but I know that, um, you know, vet of record would definitely be willing to kind of make some more of those specific recommendations. Um, there are some diets and Purina White makes one that are available on prescription by a veterinarian that would include those omega-3s in them. There's also a number of over-the-counter supplements that will kind of do that job as well. I would just talk with your vet about, you know, whether you should for that dog in particular and, you know, specific dosing, other considerations. I want to think about. Um, oh, here's a clarification on that one question earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the question was, is why would an ingredient label read corn as one ingredient, but then later on the list read cornmeal as mm -hmm. another ingredient? What, you know, yeah, why but, are they split up like that? Yeah. So basically it has to, it just has to deal with how they're put into the diet when we go into that manufacturing process. So corn is going to be that whole corn kernel. Now it's going to go through processing, uh, in cooking after that. So it's not like just a, you know, it's not like putting say feeder corn or something, uh, into the kibble and just calling it a day. 
Uh, and corn meal, similar to say a chicken meal or a meat meal is gonna have that uh, grinding and dehydrating process done to it prior. Yeah, we just have to call them out by very, very specific, um, by specific requirements and that's uh, federally regulated. Um, so I had a quick question for you because uh, I get this question a lot. Um, yeah. Oh, but for everybody that's on here, what's the main difference between the large breed, say puppy chow and mm. the normal puppy chow? So yeah, one of the big things, and we didn't really talk about this much, but for especially, I know livestock guardian dogs are mostly going to be using large breed dogs. Absolutely be feeding those juvenile animals a large breed puppy formula. And the main difference in, in my mind, there are, are a couple of, of crucial ones, but the big difference has to deal with calcium and phosphorus and the ratio that those two are in. So our large breed dogs, we really want them to grow more slowly over time. And we want those bones to grow more slowly over time. So it's not that you're saying restricting calcium and phosphorus, um, but those play different roles. And so in the body's metabolism, too much of one or the other can make the body do strange things. And so you don't necessarily uh, want to get that ratio out of whack. And so uh, the large breed puppies generally require the, that ratio to be tightly aligned, closer to a one-to-one. -one. Small breed puppies, they're going to grow and mature a lot faster. And so that calcium to phosphorus ratio doesn't need to be quite as tight as with the large breed puppies. Um, you have a bit more wiggle room, I like to say. Uh, with them. And so large breed puppies, though, it is very important to feed a large breed puppy formula specifically for the attention that's paid to that calcium and phosphorus ratios. And also important not to supplement with any calcium or phosphorus um, or calcium and phosphorus rich foods on top of that for a large breed dog either, or puppy either. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Sub. I don't think we have any other okay. questions. Um, if anybody does have any questions, my email is um, oh, in the chat box. Um, feel free to, to send me those questions and I'll forward them on to Dr. Stump for you. Um, oh, once again, I do want to thank the Sheep and Go Predator Management Board um, for funding for this position here at the AgriLife Center, uh, Dr. Redden, our uh, center director, and Robert Pritz and Jamie for getting the, the Zoom meeting and the, the Facebook Live up for me. And uh, also our sponsor today, uh, Lone Star Tracking. So, um, whoops, I think I got maybe one. Uh, well, there's just some thank yous for the presentation, Dr. Stump. And thank you all. Thank you again. Um, yeah. Oh, I appreciate your time today, ma'am. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and I'll send, I know I sent you some follow up things, but I'll send you that calorie chart too. So, yes, that. if you could, I, yeah. I would sure appreciate that to, yeah. um, for my own use here at the Center for Dogs and to forward yeah. on to producers too. So, Always happy yeah. to do. Well, thank you very much, everyone. Um, we'll see you on the next webinar. Thanks so much.